happiness comes from the inside out. When we're living congruently with our values, there's happiness because there is that sense of wholeness. His wholeness is when the way of your being matches the truth of your being. On a stormy night in Washington, D.C., I got to sit down with one of my favorite people in the world, Abram Wingle, my son. He is currently serving in the United States Air Force, and I wanted to get his opinion and take and just chat with him all about military mental health. What is your official title? in the United States Air Force. <laughs> uh, I'm a flight attendant in the United States Air Force and an airman first class. Okay, great. What what made you want to serve in the military? Did you want to be a flight attendant? Is that what your goal was? <laughs> um, I want to say my goal was really be a flight attendant, but I definitely wanted to travel. Mm. And so being a flight attendant gave me a really good opportunity to do that. <laughs> uh, so, and when did you even begin to think about serving in the military? Um, it was probably when I was first 18, mm-hmm. and I just kind of wanted to get out of my hometown and explore the world a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was one way. So when did you swear in? Um, I swore into the delayed entry program in July of 2019, um, and that's swearing into the inactive reserves. And then in July or in January 2020, I swore into active duty. And so tell us about that experience. So during the delay, what kind of things did you do? Um, So being in the DEP program, you have what's called DEP call, and you go to that once a week or every other week, and you do stuff like work out, um, learn about the rank structure, uh, the chain of command, and stuff like that. So what was it, January 6th, 2020? Yeah, That's January 6th. Signed yeah. in. And so tell us about that day. <laughs> well, that was a tough day because you, you stay in the hotel near the, the MEPS um, the night before, and that's just so there's no question about you really being late um and so you wake up super early like 4 a.m and have a quick breakfast at the at the hotel and you get bussed over and they check your weight and um your vital signs to make sure you're still healthy and then you have like the swearing in ceremony um and my family was there for that and that was and, and I had friends there too and that was pretty emotional um, so it's been something I, I was waiting for for a long time, a couple of years. And yeah, and then you say goodbye and then you hop on a bus and you make your way over to Lackland in San Antonio for basic training. Would you say that basic training was the biggest obstacle you thought of in joining the military or? At that time, basic training was definitely the biggest obstacle I faced because you hear so much about it in like movies you know and mm-hmm. what the experience is going to be like um, but I had my friends that, that had been through it and kind of told me what to expect uh, which was very helpful and yeah yeah and it was interesting coming t- to see you so after what is two months yeah two months of like almost no communication and only written letters which is a rarity these days mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, the families get to fly out and there's a big graduation and so we flew out and um, were able to see you for the first time and it was so wild to see uh, this different person and in that two short months you had grown and changed and it just really um, really the 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 stereotype is it's difficult but you come out a man is true <laughs> yeah it's true i'd have to agree with you and so i i was pleasantly surprised and proud at that um i was nervous 
that you were going to be just a shell of yourself a little bit being yelled at all the time. That's the stereotype, right? Yeah. That it's just terrible. And so I was nervous that you were going to just be this like shell of a person. And it, it turned out it wasn't that, that way. And there was such a um, different camaraderie and, and that kind of feel that I wasn't expecting, but I was mm-hmm. really proud of. And you were able to show me, um, because it's interesting for me, you were able to show me some of the things that you had to learn and the expectations that were giving to you as far as, especially as your health and how it had changed and how it was more than just men- mental or physical, for sure, physical. Yeah. What was that like? What do you remember about the other parts that you had to do besides physical training and in uh, basic training like what was the mental emotional spiritual parts what did they teach Uh, being in the air force there was a bigger focus on the academic side than other branches might have Mm. Uh, so we had lots of class we had class pretty much every day where we would learn stuff like history of the air force or Mm -hmm. um, first aid that kind of stuff and so That was definitely the mental challenge, Um, and it was a mental challenge to stay awake during those classes. (laughs) You're waking up early every day and um, and and working out, so you're pretty much always tired. And the emotional challenge, I'd say, the biggest one was just like being in a new place, Mm -hmm. um, away from with like with all new people, um, and. And yeah, you're just you're you're if at very, the beginning. You feel very alone, and it's a struggle. Mm-hmm. It's a struggle. So you know, I was looking up some some stats, some information, and it was interesting. I thought that was interesting. And from World War One until the Iraq and I, Afghanistan wars, the statistics changed dramatically. In World War One, wounded soldiers had an 80% chance of of dying and actually it's completely flipped and now wounded soldiers have an 80% chance of surviving and so there's many experts are saying that actually the new ma- battleground is psychological and there was a article in the military times in October 2019 that talked about you know, it kind of started to bring voice to this idea because in the American way, the military personnel is like the uber um, essence of strength and manliness, you know. Mm -hmm. And there has been, um, you know, sometimes that mental health or that well-being, overall well-being gets lost in the idea of this uber physical strength and and mental as far as you can't break me down you know you can't break me down right and so that emotional and the spiritual side is starting to make you know they're starting to come out with some processes for that and but one of the things that they said in this article was that you know the biggest barrier that we have we have is this idea that if you go to the mental health that that's the end of your career in the military. And I thought that was brave of them to say, this, this, is, this is the problem and here's how we're going to overcome it. And, and just, to, just to say first, like in any way, we do not want to give advice for a diagnosed mental illness. You know, the doctors are the place to go for a diagnosed mental illness. But sometimes what happens is, is we want to address the feelings first, the feelings that someone might have about seeking help for that illness. You know, it's like sometimes there's just such a barrier we don't want to seek help. Um, And that's a valid feeling to have. But feelings can be supported to where we can do that. You know, and and it's difficult. It's really difficult to seek help. And I've been there. I've had to take that first dose of medication for my own mental health. And it is really a strange and hard place to be, you know. So I just acknowledge those that are on the beginning of that journey. It is, it's a, it's a surreal place to be. And 
mental health really has two uh, avenues that often get lumped together. So there's this mental illness that's a diagnosis, and um, that's a different place. But we also talk about mental illness as the idea of not feeling happy or, or good or even feeling relaxed. And we don't often think about relaxation in the military, but relaxation can be and it can happen within a military career. You know, that's something that I think I didn't know before, but now I'm like, hey, there's it's a there's a lot that can happen in a military career that can uplift you and even right. be exciting, which is not often what people think about, you know. Some of the first research on mental health within the military started in 1941. So this is something that the military has cared about for a long, long time. And in fact, um, the Joint Chief of Staff in 2009 made a body, mind, spirit directive, and it was updated in 2020 to include eight areas of focus. And I think it's really interesting, these areas. So one for sure is physical. And they say it's the ability to physically accomplish all aspects of human performance while remaining mission capable and avoiding injury. There's environmental fitness, and that's being able to perform worldwide, you know, and there's a whole bunch that we're, we're here as we're turning into a global society. So I thought that was interesting. Medical and dental fitness, which I thought was interesting, different than physical fitness. Mm-hmm. medical and dental fitness, nutritional fitness, again, something that we, we always lump together, you know, in this physical right. fitness. We, we want to uh, find the nutrients and proportions and adequate quantities to be fed nutritionally. Spiritual fitness, was the, which is the abilities to operate one's spirituality to optimize performance. Spirituality is composed of beliefs and practices that strengthen connectedness, with sources of hope, meaning, and purpose. That's something I've always, I thought that was, that spoke to me because I, when I think about the spiritual body, I think of meaning and connectedness. I think that's the most important part. Psychological fitness, the ability, he says, the ability to integrate and improve cognitive, emotional, and behavior capabilities. Social fitness, the ability to engage in productive personal and professional relationships. Financial fitness is the last one, which I think is interesting to help build a, a combination of uh, on attitude, knowledge, and skill for self-efficiency to exercise money management and decisions that best support the circumstances of the service military's life. So, so this whole idea is like we want they, they we're, we're, we want uh, to create a whole life and care about the whole life of individuals and if many businesses kind of took this model and I, and I know everybody's not perfect at it and it's not like it's your focus of every single day being in the military mm-hmm. I know that but you know as, as groups and institutions to emphasize all these areas I think is a good start and a good example to to all the rest of us and, and, and it really is just about feeling good. It's like, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It's about how we feel about them. And it's important to point out that working on all of these areas, just working on them is not the same as feeling good and confident in these areas. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how we can feel good, better, or at ease overall. Like that's the goal. Mm-hmm. You know, what are some things you do to feel good on a daily basis? <laughs> um, well, the biggest thing that I'd say I learned from basic training as far as physically feeling good is always being well hi- hydrated. Mm-hmm. Um, until then, I didn't really know how much mo- water my body actually needed every day. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and they are really, because it's in San Antonio, so it's hot almost all the time um and so they really harp on you to be, to, to be hydrated well mm-hmm. um and you noticed a difference could you notice a difference yeah I, yeah i just noted a difference like a feeling like i had uh more energy i would say yeah and I just felt more like alert and less groggy all the time yeah 
now you you're living in um, Washington D.C. and mm-hmm. you have a little dorm or a little room, you know, yep. and so it seems like on the outside it, it could get easy to kind of get go a little stir crazy. So what do you do to combat that? Um, just making sure I first of all have stuff to do. Uh, so you know, I'll play video games in my dorm yeah. or uh, read or watch TV. Um, and then also making sure I stay in contact with like my friends and family back home or here, you know, just making sure I'm not, I'm communicating with people. And that's probably, that's probably one of the biggest things things. too. Yeah. I've been really impressed with your reading that you, and you, you even would, um, send me pictures of your needlework, you know, (laughs) you did the needlework, you things just to kind of keep your mind going and to to have something to look forward to and things like that i've been really impressed with the way you've you've done those things and made that a priority i don't know if that's always everybody's in in everybody's thought process but i've been impressed how you have read some really interesting books and learned new things and and um kept yourself busy out on your own as your mom you know that that's something i always thought i kind of felt like i had to do for you you know Mm -hmm. like that was my responsibility and so i it's really empowering for me to see you do that for yourself. Another thing I thought about is, you know, getting out in nature is one of the best things people can do to to feel better. In fact, there's an article on WebMD called, and this is why. So this was the why getting out in nature. I thought this was fascinating. It says negative ions create positive vibes. That's the name of the article. And ions are molecules that have gained or lost an electric, electrical charge. And negative ions are created in nature as air molecules break apart due to sunlight, radiation, moving air, and moving water. And they actually increase the flow of oxygen to the brain, resulting in higher alertness, decreased drowsiness, and more mental energy. In fact, Columbia University studies people with winter and chronic depression and they showed that uh, negative iron generators relieve depression as much as antidep- antidepressants. So it's not just that you get outside to do something, but literally the earth with its negative ions. And I, I think I heard once that like we are positively charged. And so you've got the earth, these things that are negatively charged. And so it just kind of balances. It's like a balance act kind right. of a thing. So getting out in nature, you know, like that is a vital for all of us, not just those in the military, but it's vital. And I, I know you've gone on some hikes and you have your motorcycle that mm-hmm. you like to ride. And I mean, yeah. you know, what does that feel like? I mean, that's the thing you, you can feel when you're riding in the winds blowing through your hair mm-hmm. <laughs> or through your helmet, through my helmet, through your helmet it, on the motorcycle. I mean, there's more to it than just gives you something to do. You know, yeah. it really is an energizing um, experience, you know, um, and so I've been glad that you've had that too. You get out in the, and you've gone hiking. You've done some yep. hike. So it's really. Um, how did you find a place t- to hike, or what? What was that like? <laughs> um, mostly, I would just Google yeah. hikes near me and, and see what there was, <laughs> and then found one that looked like the right the right distance, the right difficulty, and um, if there was pictures, I would look at that because it's. I think it's important to find a good yeah a place that you would you know, kind of vibe with and uh, somewhere where you can get done with your hike and think to yourself, wow, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So one that you could, there was some sense of accomplishment and that you knew you could accomplish. Right. Because it's not helpful to like get this ginormous goal and then not be able to reach it. Yeah. (laughs) There's nothing, you know, that's not really great. Yeah. It's better to, to like surpass it and say you can totally conquer it than to find... A goal that's just really hard to meet yeah and then you talked about connecting with friends and family and i think that's great you know now and nowadays it's nice with facetime and those kind of things that we can keep in touch that's been nice yeah that's mostly what i do yeah facetime when i can right and it you know here we are we're recording this and it's been a full year since we've seen each other mm-hmm. since we've touched each other and been in each other's presence but it's been nice to keep track of each other, even, you know, especially through the holidays. That was rough to yeah. not see each other through the holidays. You know, it's a sacrifice. It's a it's a big sacrifice. And 
I find that if I dwell on the sacrifice, then I can get low really fast. Yeah. This is the thing, too, we've talked about, you know, it's not about not letting your mind go there because that's kind of stuffing it down. Right. You know? So what what do you do when there are those times when it's just like, I want to go home? What is that like? I mean... Um, I mean, I do get homesick a lot and, and missing my family mostly more than like home, like physically home. Right. Um, once I, when I'm feeling homesick, I'll talk to them. Mm-hmm. Um... And I'll talk to my friends too, you know, just kind of the yeah. people that that I hung around with back home, and I was am still close to. Was it, it? Do you ever just give yourself time to be sad? Like, is it? Is there times when it's just I'm sad about that? Um, there are times I I probably try to keep myself busy through those times. Yeah. More than I try to just sit there and and. And dwell on it, right? Which isn't a bad thing, but right, right. It's just how I. It's a deal you've got to have a balance of it. Yeah, you know, it's a fine line between pushing it aside and and working through it. Yeah, you know, so uh, that's a very fine line, and doing things to work through it is great. You know, yeah, that's a great thing. Another thing that I think came to mind is finding a hobby. You know, I think. Um, it was interesting in the military, on the bases, you can, I looked this up and they have, usually they have fitness centers that offer weightlifting, racquetball, basketball, tennis, swimming pools, and those are usually free of charge for all the military um, families. Or, And they offer uh, fishing boats, you can rent paddle boats, canoes, fishing poles, they even have courses for that, they have skis and snowboards and hunting equipment and they even have like seasonal places of interest in local areas so that you can go through that and so I think it's really important to check out what your base has to offer and take advantage of those things to and and think of it like just trying something new you know yeah I think that's one of the best parts about the military is you get to lots of opportunities to to try something new even if you're not working or at work or doing anything having to do with the military you get lots of opportunities to learn how to canoe or Mm -hmm. go mountain biking and and stuff like that yeah i think that's great and that's something i don't think people that uh, at least for me that i wasn't um, familiar with that we don't know you know but again if 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 that's important for these big strong uber masculine people in our society Mm -hmm. i think it's important for us to do that for ourselves to try and let ourselves have that recreation like i say i was talking about relaxation like they make relaxation important and we often kind of think that's um they're two different areas of life like you have your work life and then your relaxation is totally different but one helps the other you know one feeds the other yeah absolutely so the last area I kind of wanted to talk to you about was, you know, there there has been, um, well, in all of society, and the military has been one to, you know, they, they have a number, you know, they can, they can number it where the rest of us don't as much, but there has been, you know, some struggle with mental health and, and um, how can we help each other? I think that's the biggest obstacle is that we don't really understand what it's like. So when we come in contact with it, if it's within ourselves, we just kind of r- run the other way. Or if it's with someone else, we kind of just don't know what to say. And I think first we need to understand that feelings are a physical. The body is feeling um, fear or dread or grief or loss that all of those are a full body response. And, you know, we, we rarely are just simply having thoughts running through our minds. And even if we do have thoughts running through our minds, they are pumping more and more sensations in the body. So we are feeling in every sense of the word. Um, and so it's so much more than an emotion. And I think that's some, a, a big piece of the puzzle because when someone's not doing well 
we, we immediately want to go and ask them what what happened or what's going on in their mind. Right. You know? And it's such a different experience than just, well, you know, we might have worry and we can talk about these things we're worried about. And sometimes talking through it is helpful, but sometimes that body is just completely engaged and talking, bring, being talked down from that place isn't as easy as we think. If we can understand that within ourselves, how that works, then maybe we can come at helping others in a different direction. So the first thing, of course, when helping someone else is to ask. And I think a lot of times, even in, in secular society, when, when somebody's had a hard time, we kind of think we need to not talk about that you know, in order to, we don't want to upset them. Like when, when someone has a, a death in the family, we often don't say anything because we don't want to stress them out. Yeah. But it's actually the opposite. That's true. You know, yeah. asking is really important, but I think it's important to say, to also add to that. I think as a society, we're more often to say, Hey, how are you doing? You know, is there anything I can do? Those two questions, we already know the answer. You know, how are you? The answer is always fine. Yep. <laughs> if we can practice maybe having some other some other things to say to be on on the tips of our tongue then maybe we can um, support each other a little a better so you know I thought about you know try and think of these kind of questions like how are you feeling about and then be specific right I know in, in your specific case you're you're newly in and you you haven't you know it's not like you've seen combat or those kind of things. Yeah. And so this is not something you've had to deal with. But, you know, instead of just saying, how are you, say, you know, to ask, how are you feeling? Yeah, be specific about that. Because if somebody says, how are you feeling about tomorrow's stress, whatever that is, you know, that gives them the opportunity to not say just fine. They can still invite you into their vulnerability or not but it's just kind of how are you is just kind of a i've checking it off the list yeah <laughs> I've, I've asked you how you are but i really don't want to know you know if you ask them a more specific question they can give you a more specific answer right exactly and another way to communicate with people is to say you know you seem to be you seem to me to be sad or lonely or upset or even exhausted. And that gives them, oh, you know, an opportunity to say, oh, to be able to speak. And they can just, again, they can say, oh, I'm, I'm fine. You know, they, they don't, if they're, if they're wanting their privacy, I think they can still yeah. do that. But it, but you're kind of just giving them, off, letting them off the hook from having to reach out, you know, because that reaching out is really vulnerable. And although it would be great if we all just reached out when we need help, the reality is, is we don't. And so if we can step forward together as a community and kind of meet people halfway with some of these questions, you know. And then when you listen, it's really important to listen to what they have to say. And it's really validating and healing to follow a pattern of by showing that you're listening by repeating back some of what they are telling you for example you know if somebody says you know if you say how are you feeling about tomorrow there's something big tomorrow and then they tell you then your answer can be so you're you feel that dot 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 or it sounds like you are worried about tomorrow you know and so you really answer back and it sounds like you're just literally repeating what they had to say right but being in that place it really helps to have the to me this is that part where it, you don't think about it in the military but this is really this this is really what they talk about when they say like your spiritual health that's really where it comes you have this connection with that person and there's this back and forth of it almost feels like energy back and forth and this person feels heard and this person's hearing and and there's this really interesting dynamic that gets created by acknowledging their feelings and it never hurts to say or repeat over and over again that you care 
and share the, your concern, but don't panic or don't, you know, the, the judgment isn't there either. This goes for all kinds of people inside and outside the military, you know. The other thing too is when someone comes and you know, um, and you know that they're struggling with su suicidal thoughts or those kind of things. We often don't want to bring it up in order to not trigger anything. Not trigger anything, but the opposite can be true. To say, "Hey, I know that you're struggling," especially if they've told you, "I, you know, that you're struggling," and I hear that this is a difficult time for you. I can, you know, just being there and and supporting and not judging. Right. In the military, we're actually taught to be very direct about about suicide in particular. Like if if you think somebody's struggling, or not even if, if you think, but if you know somebody is, be very direct about asking them. Don't don't be walking on eggshells or anything, because right. that's just gonna make things worse between you and the other person. Yeah. Um, so just be very direct and caring and. Yeah, And there's so much truth to that because, honestly, what I talked about before, when you're having this full body experience and, and you know, suicidal thoughts, there's thoughts going through your mind about lots of different things, but your whole body is in a state. And in that elevated state, even someone being uncomfortable in your presence, it, it feels like it feels... 10 times more. I mean, it's like somebody stomping around, you know, it's yeah. like when you have a headache and people are loud, any kind of tiptoe or any kind of discomfort or, or not wanting to be in that space just is amplified in that space. In people that. can feel that. They can feel it like 10 times the amount and it just feeds into the stress of the whole thing. You know, it's, it's scary when you go to talk to somebody about Suicide. I mean, that is not a comfort zone, right? <laughs> that yeah. is not a comfort zone. But we have the capacity to feel within our own bodies that maybe our stomach is churning a little bit or our heart is beating quickly. And if we can just within ourselves recognize that and just kind of take, it takes a half a second to just say, wow, this is scary to me, you know, and the best thing to do is to bring the sensations into the heart. The heart just seems to, if we can deep breath into the heart, it just seems to kind of find a place where compassion just can flow. And then we get out of our own skin of discomfort and and then we can be there as a, as a witness for someone else's pain. And sometimes the witness is what we need. That being alone is, that's what the, gets crazy is because we feel like we're alone and we um and nobody understands and that's a really difficult place to be it just can things can spin rather quickly and in fact i think i uh i read an article that if you can help someone it's like there's like a seven minute window that you can help someone get through that that they've done studies for people that have survived they're t they're they're trying to take their own life and and they've they've kind of said that if they can get through that those seven minutes is all it takes to help somebody through that i think it's so heroic that these heroes like you abram that are the heroes of our country are being taught how to be heroes psychologically and i i hope that the rest of society somehow will follow along with the military's desire to, to kind of shine some light on these things. It's never easy. As soon as, as soon as the statistics comes out, we all can point our finger and say, well, they're the problem, but it's really our, our, all of us. This, this shows up in all parts of society. And it's, it takes a big, a big person to stand up and say, hey, we're going to look at it and we're going to come out with some ways to to shine light on it and uh, I know that was one thing in even in basic training you know that from the very beginning that was a factor in keeping your well-being meaning the, all parts of you not just your muscles yep. you know not just your muscles to be strong but all the parts of you for yourself and not just for the military 
Right. You know? Yeah, I was really surprised to see how quickly it it changed who you were, and you were amazing before, but it was just like you grew in so many different ways, and I was surprised at how those other areas of, of life, the emotional, mental, social, physical, spiritual, were all part of the training, and so I appreciate it. I know I'm your mom, but I appreciate and we are so grateful for your willingness to serve and sacrifice Thank your you. time. So Thank you. Thanks for your time today. Happy to be here. Thank you for listening. Join the community of knowledge and growth at thewholenessnetwork.com.